Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number six of Alice's Adventures. We are getting back uh, to Alice uh, in time this week to meet the Queen of Hearts, um, who likes ordering executions, at the very least. Uh, and um, then uh, we're... Uh, <laughs> I hopefully going to get as far as the mock turtle uh, and, and his really excellent academic curriculum, uh, not to mention poetry. So uh, great deal uh, to be uh, discussed there. Yes, thank you, Jocelyn. I am uh, I'm I'm feeling better. I I did get sick last week. I had COVID last week, um, and I've mostly recovered. <clears throat> I may have to cough occasionally here this evening. Uh, but I'm definitely doing better. Um, I wanted to uh, begin with a couple of announcements. First, just a reminder that we have our our regional moot cycle for the uh, the coming year is beginning already. Um, so we're gonna uh, we're starting in Ohio, of course, uh, this year. This is our first ever Ohio moot. Buckeye moot is happening on the 30th of July. Uh, now this is very important though because. Um, we have to close registration a little bit early, so uh, I, the two weeks earlier on the on the sixteenth of July. Um, that's next Saturday. So th by the end of next week, we have to close down for in person registration. And I know that people tend to register for regional moots a little bit later uh, at, at the last minute. That's okay normally, <clears throat> but less okay this year. So or at least with Buckeye moot. <clears throat> so, um, we, it's just a venue requirement that we need to, we need to, uh, close that down two weeks early. So if you are in the greater Cincinnati area, Cincinnati is where we're going to be just out, just on the, uh, the outskirts of Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, on Saturday, July 30th, starting at 9am. Um, I'd love, would love to meet you there in Ohio. Looking forward to going to Ohio. This is, uh, um, I've not spent a lot of time in Ohio, actually. I've not lived far from Ohio, but um, I think I think this is the second time in my life I'm going to Ohio on purpose. Actually, I've driven through it a couple times, uh, but um, uh, but like setting out from home with Ohio as my destination, I think this might be my second time ever. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> to being in Ohio uh, and meeting you guys. Um, so uh, come join us for Buckeye Moot and just do remember to sign up if you want to come in person. Now we have remote attendance possible as well, of course. Um, this regional moot, like all of our regional moots, are going to be a hybrid experience. So you can attend remotely and the signups for that will go right up until the very end. But uh, if you wanted to come in person, you do need to sign up before uh, uh, next week, before the end of next week. Um, so wanted to make sure to remind you about that. And of course, the other thing I wanted to uh, remind people of or inform people of if you hadn't heard yet was my big announcement at MythMoot this year, which is the combination uh, announcement that we are starting the Signum University Press and that at the Signum University Press, uh, the first thing that we are going to publish is my new book. Um, Exploring the Lord of the Rings, Volume 1. So for those of you who have read my Exploring the Hobbit book, um, this is going to be a very similar uh, uh, a very similar uh, 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 <clears throat> setup to that. Um, I'm doing a six volume discussion of the Lord of the Rings. Um, it's going to be a chapter by chapter discussion uh, of the book. So volume one is going to cover book one. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not doing it by volume. I'm doing it by book. So I'm going to be discussing book one, which means from the long expected party through the flight to the fort, basically. So um, <clears throat> that's what the first book is going to, is going to cover. Um, yeah. Oh, isn't the isn't the cover image awesome, uh, Tomas? I love this. Uh, this is uh, some art that was done for me by Emily Austin, uh, new Signum alumna from our MA program. Um, Emily's artwork is fantastic. So um, we have yes, the um, uh, the very the the very first here. Is there any crossover between this project and the digital exploring the Lord of the Rings work? Yes, there will be. Fourth Dauntless, the digital exploring the Lord of the Rings uh, web page. Um, is going to be a delightful resource. <clears throat> the thing, one of the things that's most painful to me about writing, like writing the Hobbit book, 
was selecting. Like there's so many things that I wanted to mention or talk about or observations I want, that I just couldn't. I mean, you can't talk about everything in the course of a in the course of a book, right? You've got to select. Um, and I'm going to be delighted to have our digital Exploring the Lord of the Rings resource as a place that I can link to uh, from the book and say for further discussion, you know, footnote for further discussion on this point, go over here and there's much more. Um, so that hope that will be uh, that will be really really nice. Um, so uh, now the way this is, here's, here's, let me explain the way this is going to work, because uh, this is coming out differently than normal. One of the ways in which I am really excited to experiment with uh, modern digital publishing uh, is to make the publication process, even the creative process, uh, a more collaborative one. Exploring the Lord of the Rings um, has been, of course, I've been doing the Tuesday evening uh, discussions on Exploring the Lord of the Rings now for six years, something like that. Seven years. No, five and a half. Five and a half now. Um, we've been going so far. Um, but uh, anyway, you know, so much of the observations that I've made and stuff, you know, so so the, 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 the primary relationship, of course, between the book and the class discussions, the class discussions are very in-depth, right? We're going very slowly, sentence by sentence through the book and making lots of observations. But of course, what we don't have the chance to do in that discussion is draw conclusions, right? Really just sort of step back and look at the larger patterns and uh, trace the larger themes and draw some conclusions about things. Um, so that's... um. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing in the book. Um, the book is a really, uh, in this way, a really logical companion to the uh, in-depth discussions that we're doing um, in, in that way, to be able to look at the patterns and draw conclusions. But um, as I said, like the way that this book has emerged from, uh, has emerged from the the class discussions and all of the, the sort of organic uh, um, uh, discoveries that we've made together, um, it really seemed uh, very natural to be um, incorporating the community more into the process of publishing and of even writing the book. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, the book is available now for pre-order, um, and I'm going to be releasing the chapters as it works in progress. So every time I complete a chapter, I'm going to drop that chapter. Um, so you can pre-order the book now. And you'll get the chapters as they come. I'm going to be writing about one a month. Uh, uh, we'll be releasing, hopefully, there's a possibility of a snag there, but hopefully we'll be releasing the first one in August. Um, and <clears throat> so the, 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 the draft of chapter one in August and then one a month thereafter. Uh, 13 chapters, uh, 12 chapters, one in each chapter of uh, book one of the, the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, and then uh, concluding chapter. Um, so... I'm going to be dropping the chapters as I come so that you can read along and you can see sort of how things are developing. So there, there, there are three different ways in which you can uh, experience this. One is you could choose, if you wanted, just to wait. <laughs> right? You could just wait. Uh, and when the book is completed, it'll be completed like next fall. Um, uh, then you can buy the final, uh, you know, the finalized book when it's out and, and done. That's an option. You could you can do that. And if you want to do that, it'll be out next fall uh, and uh, that'll be cool. Um, but if you would like to read it as it goes along and maybe even have an opportunity to give some feedback and stuff, um, then what you can do is pre-order now. Uh, the cost of the the ebook is $20. It's also going to be available in audiobook form. I'm narrating on an audiobook as I go as well. Um, so you can buy uh, just the ebook version. You can buy just the audiobook version, or you can get both. Um, so you pay for the you pay for the book now, and you'll get the chapter installments as they come out. And then when we finalize everything, and everything is is uh, is written and revised and uh, released in uh, much fancier form, uh, then you'll get the the you know ebook or audiobook or both, uh, whatever whatever it is you order. Um, at that point, then when it comes out. So you'll be getting the chapters as they come, and then you'll get automatically a copy of the final book as well. Um, the third choice is uh, for folks... Oh, yes. Uh, so, so JJ is asking, it will, we will be doing uh, print-on-demand. Uh, will it be possible in hardcover? I think possibly, JJ. I, we, I, I will be honest... I've not, we've not planned the print on demand yet. That is, we have plans that it's going to happen, but we're not going to do print on demand until we have the completed 
book, which, as I said, is like next fall. So um, I'm not planning the details of that yet. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I can't answer too many specific questions uh, other than to say, if you want to get a version in paper, we can do that. Um, that'll be that'll be fine. And yes, Mighty Felix, uh, the audiobook is going to be narrated by me. That's right. I'm going to be I'm going to be reading the book. Um, it was possible for me to get another reader. We have a bunch of people who uh, we have some really talented readers, uh, but um, I, I wanted to read it. Uh, it emerged, uh, especially the way that this is emerging from the class discussions. I really wanted to narrate it myself, um, <clears throat> but. Um, Yes, I did do an audiobook of my uh, my Hobbit book. Uh, that's available on Audible. Um, uh, was still last time I saw. Uh, so, yep, yeah, I did. I did do that before. Uh, looking forward to doing that again here. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> okay. So, um, but as I said, there is a third option as well. So the first option is just to wait until the book comes out next fall. The second option is to pre-order now. Um, and by the way, there are two ways you can pay for that. You can just pay uh, $20 now and you'll get all the chapters. Um, it is po We're going to do a monthly subscription uh, version. So you can just subscribe for $2 a month. Um, uh, uh, you know, kind of spread it out over the course of the year. Um, and uh, so either of those will be available. The subscription version is not available quite yet, but it will be when the first chapter is ready. Uh, and uh, then, but there's a third option. Uh, the third option is uh, what I call the author circle. Um, and those are for people who would like to be sort of patrons of the book and who would also like to be more actively engaged. So if you just pre-order the book, you'll get advanced access to the book, right? To the chapters as they come. And then you'll see, and then you'll, you'll get the final version of the book when it comes out. Um, but if you'd like to be more actively involved uh, in sort of the community of, uh, of the book uh, and more actively in discussion, we have the author circle. Um, and people in the author circle will get both the... Uh, the text version and the audio version uh, every time a chapter drops. Um, and then there's some, um, I'm also going to be doing some uh, work in progress stuff. So uh, people in the author circle will get access to some of my, my outlines and notes. So you can see what I'm thinking as I'm planning out the chapter that I'm in the middle of writing. Um, and I'm going to do some, one of the things that helps me a lot, actually, I do little like brainstorming videos and stuff when I, I often, I need to talk things out often. So I'll be talking things out with my uh, author circle people so that you can hear that as I'm kind of making some decisions and thinking through some stuff as I'm working uh, on a particular chapter, then you'll get the chapter, as I said, and then after the chapter has come out, um, every month between chapter releases, we'll do a live meeting um, where we'll get together and I can get input from you guys. So you guys can give me feedback and we can discuss the chapter uh, that happened. And um, of course, if you guys make brilliant suggestions that I want to incorporate uh, into the book, then obviously I'll, 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 I'll cite you. You'll get, you'll get footnotes in the book uh, for your suggestions. Uh, and of course, in any case, I'll have uh, all of the author circle listed uh, in the acknowledgments uh, at the beginning of the book uh, as well. And then you'll get a personalized version uh, of the book uh, when it comes out uh, at the end. So um, this is, as I say, these are for uh, the author circle. And so the author circle is more expensive. It's uh, a, a monthly subscription, $25 a month. Um, as I say, this is really for people who, who really want to be patrons of the book, not only to be much more intimately involved in the process of the book, but also to help to support me and to su help to support Signum uh, and the Signum Press. Um, so, uh, you know, that's really appreciate it. And I want to give people the opportunity to do that. Um, so anyway, that's what's happening. Uh, so the, um, my book is, it's happening. It's happening. Uh, we've, I've begun it. Uh, and, uh, I am looking forward to, uh, coming alongside, uh, a bunch of you. Um, there's already been uh, a number of people who have signed up for the author circle, looking forward to, uh, beginning my journey, uh, more closely along with you guys and everybody else. The first chapter will be coming soon. Um, and, uh, you'll be able to watch the book unfold as we come through. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, now I'm planning to, wait until I finish discussing each book of the Lord of the Rings before I write the next volume. Um, so it, it does take people often a few minutes to kind of do the math and say, wait, wait, wait a second. Does this mean you're not going to publish volume six of exploring the Lord of the Rings? 
for like another 30 years. Um, yes, yes, that's exactly what it means. Um, uh, that most likely Exploring the Lord of the Rings Volume 6 will be the last uh, book I ever publish, very likely. Um just as finishing exploring the Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the class in which we discuss, well, I'm back, will probably uh, be the last uh, the last broadcast I ever do. I don't know. Um, but um, but so for Thoughtless, you see, there's no danger of a George Martin situation because uh, it's wholly different. Right. Uh, this is not uh, uh, just continuous delays. You'll. You'll be able to come along with me in the class discussions and know exactly when we are on progress for this. Um, but of course, what this, the way that I'm looking at this, um, is it means that we're going to have um, uh, we're going to have a lot of opportunity for more stuff. Um, I'm hoping to do other books this way in this kind of a serial production format. Um, to be honest, one of the reasons why I wanted to experiment with doing this this way, I do think it's going to be really fun doing this kind of in community with people. I think that's a really neat opportunity uh, and will be a really, really fun uh, thing to do. Um, but also, this is a way for me to be able to add something like this. Um, I um, have wanted to write this book for a long time, and I've not been able to. Um, and I think that this this will be a mechanism that will enable me to do this, and hopefully other projects as well. Uh, so for those of you who have been following along with the Mythgard Academy, I am. Um, there's a bunch of Mythgard Academy related books I'd love to write too. Um, I have at least one Watership Down book that I'd like to write. Um, and, uh, I have this idea for like, a, uh, you know, a, a, a book about all the things I've learned from Watership, like lessons from Watership Down, basically. Um, I, um, I would love to do a Dracula book. Um, so there's a, there's a, and, and also a, some, a bunch of things from the history of Middle Earth as well. I would love to do a book on the history of the Lord of the Rings, um, really looking at how the Lord of the Rings story develops. So going back, you know, thinking of our discussions uh, on the history of the Lord of the Rings volumes, which the Return of the Shadow, Treason of Isengard, and War of the Ring, um, and just uh, to help people, because I think that a lot of those books are not the most accessible books in the world, right? And so I think that there are a lot of Tolkien fans who just don't know that story. Um, and I would love to be able to kind of bring out that story and sort of show, um, again, a kind of a big picture book version, right, of the discussion that we had there. Um, and uh, um, and then we, um, uh, I would love to, you know, I might do some, I might do some other things like on Tolkien's early stuff and, and, uh, you know, maybe a book, uh, goodness, there was so much, wasn't that Morgoth's ring discussion we had, whoo, right. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah. So, uh, so there's so much, there's so much to do, even apart from like, you know, exploring the Silmarillion and, uh, uh, you know, a book on Tolkien's short stories. I mean, I'd love to write something on Leaf by Niggle and uh, Farmer Giles of Ham and, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of stuff that we can do. Um, so I think we'll have uh, we'll have plenty to keep us busy uh, during the years in which I'm cheerfully discussing, uh, you know, uh, book three or whatever uh, uh, in on Tuesday nights uh, until we can uh, go through and do volume one there. So um, anyway, that is a Tolkien math book. We totally could do that, Gerald. Uh, yes. World building with Tolkien, starting with long division. Um, but anyway, so uh, I think that this is going to be a lot of fun. And as I say, my hope is that this this mechanism, this, this method of serial publication, you know, serial... Yeah, well, essentially serial publication um, that we're experimenting with, uh, with this book. And yes, for those who came in late, Exploring the Lord of the Rings, Volume 1, it is happening. Um, uh, you can uh, sign up right now and you will get the chapters as they come and be uh, you can be a part of the process. So anyway, this is this is the, the vision that I have um, because I would really love... Uh, as I, you know, enter my declining years here, uh, I would really love to add more writing 
uh, to my uh, to my life. Basically, I would love to 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 get some of the stuff that we have been talking about together um, down in sort of clearer and more compressed form uh, in book form. That would mean a lot to me. I would really like to do that. So um, so yeah. So. This is where we're starting, exploring the Lord, of the, the Lord of the Rings, Volume 1. If you want to get it, here's what you do. Um, go to press.signumuniversity.org, which is this page here, and then you can go and click on the book down here. Here's the book page. Um, the book is being will be uh, sold and delivered through BlackBerry. So you click here. You can read the introductory chapter right now. Um, you, this is where you sign up for BlackBerry. BlackBerry is um, uh, our uh, little registration system where we do all of our space uh, course registrations and things. Um, but you go to BlackBerry, you have to create a little account, but it's 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 not a big deal. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, then you come into Exploring the Lord of the Rings, Volume 1. Uh, this is where you click through right now to read the introduction. Here's my introductory chapter right here um, where I explain about the book and what it's doing. And then um, you'll remember in my Hobbit book, if you read my Hobbit book, I had, uh, I, you know, all every chapter I did, you know, each chapter related to a particular chapter in the book, uh, of course. Um, but I was tracing some themes across the whole book, right? So I had the different sections of the different uh, chapters. Well, I'm doing the same thing in Exploring the Lord of the Rings, except the Lord of the Rings is huge compared to The Hobbit. Um, uh, so I have not only themes, but also sort of sub-threads within those themes uh, that I'm tracing. So in the introduction here, I go through and I explain all of the main themes and sub-threads that I will be uh, tracing all the way through my discussion of The Lord of the Rings. Anyway, so you can read the introduction. Uh, everyone can read it for free. Just create a BlackBerry account and you can access the introductory chapter for free. Um, and then scrolling down, these are the, these are the purchase options. Uh, $20 for the ebook or the audiobook version, $30 for both of them. Um, and then again, uh, Author Circle, $25 for the first month. So that's how it works. You can, uh, you can get involved right now. And as I said, the plan which I am hoping that we will be able to stick to, uh, is August for chapter one. So, um, and if not, then as soon thereafter as possible. Um, but, um, but there we are. So that's where you can find it and what's going on. Uh, uh, spread the news. I think this is, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm really, uh, this is something that I, I'm, I'm hoping not only am I hoping that this uh, this whole uh, kind of serial publication thing that I'm experimenting with, with exploring the Lord of the Rings, um, not only do I hope that it's going to be a success because I can envision myself writing many books this way over the course of the rest of my career, but... Um, uh, but it's something that we are hoping to be able to extend uh, in other ways. You know, there are lots of ways in which at Signum University Press, we're hoping to kind of think outside the rather narrow uh, confines that many publishing houses still think in uh, as if they were still restricted by the printing press, which they are not. So anyway, um, I'm... So I'm, there's 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 a whole bunch of different projects that we will have coming up, um, some more book projects, fiction and uh, nonfiction, uh, some uh, audio and uh, uh, video uh, content as well, um, which is going to be uh, pretty awesome. So Aaron, yes, the author circle is twenty five dollars a month. That is that is I, that is significantly more expensive. As I said, that's for patrons of the book basically uh and as i say you'll get you you'll get you get lots of stuff uh you and you'll get lots of access to the process and uh, uh meetings with me and everything um but you don't have to do that if you just want to get access to the chapters as they drop um then just that you pay the one time twenty dollar fee just buy the book for twenty dollars right and we'll send you the chapters uh as they come so uh there's there's both both options there. Um, the more economical option and then the other, you know, as I say, patronage option uh, to be able to really uh, get, get a lot of additional access for yourself. Uh, and then also, um, uh, you know, being a part of the process, but just being a patron uh, to, the pro to the project, you know, both to me personally and to, uh, uh, to the press as well. So... Um, <clears throat> That's the plan. Uh, all right, so let us get back into Alice here. We have um, a dangerous amount of poetry uh, coming up, so we should we should get into that. Um, 
We got as far as chapter eight. Um, when the procession came opposite to Alice, they all stopped and looked at her, and the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. Idiot, said the queen, tossing her head impatiently, and turning to Alice, she went on. What's your name, child? My name is Alice, so please your majesty, said Alice very politely. But she added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards, after all. I needn't be afraid of them. And who are these, said the queen, pointing to the three gardeners who were lying around the rose tree. For you see, as they were lying on their faces, and the pattern on their backs was the same as the rest of the pack, she could not tell whether they were gardeners or soldiers or courtiers or three of her own children. How should I know, said Alice, surprised at her own courage. It's no business of mine. Okay. Um, so, um, the... Uh, Alice's transition here into the royal grounds, right, meeting the Queen of Hearts, which whom ha, who has already been discussed in fairly fearsome terms, right, um, and she's rather surprised to discover that they are, as she said, only a pack of cards after all, right. Um, she sees the procession of them, and so the play with the deck of cards. Of course, there are some jokes that are being made which are jokes on the patterns of cards and of the uh, the design the standard design of the face cards um, but um, the thing that I am most interested in in thinking about Alice and the cards because the Queen of Hearts and uh, this whole court here is going to be the sort of center piece of the entire second half of the book essentially. Um, and um, I, uh, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I want to be remembering, first I want to be remembering that we're always, we're talking to cards, right? Um, and this seems to me important. Um, it seems to me important because it seems to me also connected to uh, the questions of identity and even some of the questions of language that we've been looking at through the story so far. Um, identity is the thing that I was primarily interested in this particular passage right here. Um, that is the queen's complete ignorance of who are the three persons that because they've fallen on their faces, right? Um and so you'll notice sort of the play there. On the one hand, we have uh, this, and this is one of the effects of, of having all of these people be animate cards, right? Not just associated with cards, but actually animated cards themselves, right? Um, so notice this adds sort of two layers of our understanding of the entire situation, right? What have they done? The queen comes in and these are, these are simple gardeners, right? They're just little number cards. Um, what do they do? <clears throat> they bow down before her, right? They prostrate themselves on their faces before their queen, which seems like a perfect, um, <clears throat> a perfect, uh, perfectly appropriate, perhaps slightly extreme, but appropriate act of reverence, right? And so if we, <clears throat> if we think about them as people, we kind of draw one conclusion about their action, right? But then when we realize their their cards, the situation now suddenly changes, right? Because a card which prostrates itself upon its face is uh, concealing them itself, right? I mean, th what we're confronted, the scene we're confronted with is three cards laid out face down on a table, like, you know, you know, in a game of poker or something, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You, it, it, uh, uh, First Fish is thinking about, um, you know, the three face down cards uh, in a match battle in the card game War. Yeah, there are lots of games which will have cards face down like this, right? Three card Monty. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so all of a sudden that's now, that's also on the one hand, again, on the sort of human level, 
you have this act of extreme deference, right, by these cards. But on the card level, um, there's this act of concealment. And she's, the queen, instead of being honored, is puzzled. She can't tell who these people are. They could be soldiers, gardeners, courtiers, or three of her own children, for all she knows, because the pattern on their backs is the same as all the rest of the pack, right? Of course, as cards always are, right? Um, So the way that this adds this sort of second level of doubling, right, onto this, um, I thought that this kind of drew attention to that really interestingly um, and kind of cues us to be thinking about what's happening here um, in different ways. Even the way in which the queen keeps going around, right? Um, I... the sort of progression of the queen. Uh, There were several points. I don't know... I don't know old card games well enough to be confident that uh, I can try to work it out, right? But I got the impression that there was a card game being... that that, that, like an actual game that is uh, sort of serving as a kind of subtext here. Right, that is serving as a, as a sort of a base play. Uh, Lewis Carroll does this kind of thing all the time. He'll do it with chess in uh, Through the Looking Glass, um, but he's doing it with cards here. Um, and I get this sense, the way that the king and queen are moving together, right? I, I that there's some actual game, like the way that they they come in lined up, right? Like you might lay out cards in a particular way, uh, like whether it's like laying out matches uh, or runs in like gin rummy or something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> again, I don't know what game exactly it is that they're playing. I don't think it's Whist, uh, Brick Tales. I have played Whist, um, and I uh, it's like Bridge. It's not exactly like Bridge, but it's similar to Bridge. Um, so I don't think um, it would be quite like that. Um, but... Um, Anyway, so, um, right, yeah, JJ says in Three Card Monty, it's usually the queen who's one of the face-down cards among two numbered cards, and this seems like a little reversal uh, in some ways. Yeah, I, 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 I would be willing to guess, JJ, that the direct reference in this scene probably is Three Card Monty, the way that, because the guessing element right? Where the queen comes in and she's, she's wondering what are these face down, these three face down cards, right? Um, and Alice's response, how should I know, right? Um, uh, it's no business of mine, right? She's not the dealer, right? She, she's not gonna, she's not gonna show the cards, right? She's, she, you know, anyway, I, I, I think that there's, as I say, I don't know the card games well enough to know, but I suspect that there's an actual play with real games going on here. And so we have a couple different layers of the narrative happening at the same time here, which is which is fun. Again, it'd be more fun if I could place it exactly. This, I think, is one of the reasons why... I, I mean, I've always enjoyed uh, Through the Looking Glass more, and part of the reason I enjoy Through the Looking Glass more is that I know more about chess than I know about 19th century card games. Uh, so it's a little easier for me to follow the multiple levels of what's going on there than it is here. But I think it is here. Um, and uh, and I suspect, and I also suspect, of course, that it's not a very elaborate card game. Like, that is, I, I doubt it's something like Whist. Um, I suspect it's something that a child would play, that a child would be, uh, would, uh, just like a child can play chess as well. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, um, okay, let's keep going, thinking about this sort of stuff as we go. Um, the croquet tournament. The croquet tournament seemed to me to kind of bring things together in a, uh, well, my, um, my allegory sensor was going off when I got here. Um, so let's, um, let's read this passage. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet ground in her life. 
It was all ridges and furrows. The croquet balls were live hedgehogs and the mallets live flamingos, and the soldiers had to double themselves up and stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. I think we talked about this a little bit, didn't we? I, I end with this passage last time. Let's reread it. We don't have to talk at length about it again. But if I'm remembering correctly, I talked about this at the end of last time, right? The chief difficulty Alice found at first was in managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away comfortably enough under her arm, with its legs hanging down, but generally, just as she had got its neck nicely straightened out and was going to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up in her face with such a puzzled expression that she could not help bursting out laughing. And when she had got its head down and was going to begin again, it was very provoking to find that the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all this, there was generally a ridge or a furrow in the way, uh, f- furrow in the way, whenever she wanted to send her hedgehog to. And as the doubled-up so- soldiers were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. Um, and the point that I was making at the end of last time is that the way that this croquet tournament, right, to do. Croquet is a sufficiently complicated game in one sense, right? Um, You have several different factors, right? There's the ball. uh, There's any any resistance or irregularities of the ground, right? There's the other player's balls. uh, There's the arches that you're trying to to get it through. There's a lot of things to coordinate, right? Um, And you're trying to get it through before other people and everything. Um, and being able to knock other people aside and all that sort of thing, right? But of course, that kind of game generally relies upon set rules, right? There are set rules. That's kind of how games in general work. Uh, But croquet is certainly one which has a lot of these kinds of things, right? Um, If your mallet is not a solid mallet, right? And your ball is alive and gets up and moves and the arches get up and move. You can't play a game at all. And there's, and the ground is not even, right? Every single element in this game uh, that is supposed to be fixed so that your one moving and otherwise inert ball, right, is able to kind of navigate through. Um, This is how the game is. The game requires these kinds of rules, right? But here what we see is that none of those things happen. The mallet is itself a a live flamingo, right, which has opinions of its own uh, and is... I, I, yeah, I too love the uh, it looking at her with a with a puzzled expression, Karita. Um, <coughs> you know, it's um, it has to cooperate with this process, as does your ball, right? Um, so, what I and again, this is what I believe I was talking about at the end of last time. Um, what I can't help but associate with this, based on what we've seen before, is you think about all of the other, like the other games that Alice has been trying to play. You know, games like communicating with people, games like um, social discourse, (laughs) the game of social discourse, how to converse with someone else, especially with a stranger, right? In a strange situation that you don't know. And here, of course, I'm thinking particularly about the Mad Tea Party, uh, where we saw those rules being transgressed all the time, right? Remember the riddle thing at the beginning, um, when Alice was asked something that she thought to be a riddle and she was immediately delighted, right? Because she knows the rules of that game. And she immediately felt sort of at home, right? Here are these strange people doing strange things and I'm trying to start a conversation with them. Well, he's asked me a riddle. Great. Now I know where I am, right? And I I can think about that and I can ask for hints or whatever and I can guess that and then maybe I can ask him a riddle and our conversation will go on swimmingly, right? But once that framework has been invoked, the uh, the rules immediately start changing, right? And it turns out it wasn't a riddle at all that he was asking. Um, and then every time she tries to either use some kind of stock response or to ask um, a sort of simple question, uh, things like, the, again, the, 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 the archers keep getting up and moving away, right? This is happening conversationally, socially to Alice all the way through. And if we think back further to the struggles that she was having with the mouse, 
uh, at the, you know, the mouse with the long, sad tail uh, near the beginning of the book. There we saw her failing uh, to kind of stay. She, we saw her failing because she was self-absorbed, right? We saw her absorption with her own body. Again, the stories about, you know, about Alice's uh, body growing and shrinking. Um, and we saw her getting so lost in her own interests and own desires, such as her desire to talk about her pet cat, Dinah, that she was offending the mouse, right? And she was not listening to the mouse and all that kind of thing. Um, but she, um, so we saw her sort of failing to play the game and then we see, as we went on, we see the game changing and changing and her becoming more and more aware of the challenges of that. And we'll see later on that there is, um, there's some, Alice is changing. There's some progress, I think, that's being made in Alice as she's going through this experience. Um, now, I don't think she's necessarily processing the kind of metaphorical level of the croquet game here, right? I don't think she's actually sitting here seeing, you know, Alice is sitting here seeing the croquet, this uh, remarkable, uh, this curious croquet ground uh, as a, you know, metaphor for the conversational field that she's been attempting to navigate uh, prior to this. Um, but, uh, but I think that we can begin to see the sort of effects of this and her conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. Right. Um, uh, well, yes, I, she was failing to navigate it well with the mouse, for instance, at first, and that seemed to be mostly her fault. Um, but increasingly through the caterpillar and then the duchess, uh, uh, the duchess and the cook, right? And then, uh, especially at the mad tea party, um, and to some extent with the Cheshire cat. And then of course, remember the bird and the serpent thing, um, things, things have not been remaining. She, <clears throat> she doesn't know who she is. Um, her own body keeps growing and changing. Uh, the rules of conversation keep shifting. The meanings of words even keep changing around her. Um, so, I, this is why, in the context of all this, when we suddenly get this, <clears throat> as she says, very curious croquet ground, um, as I say, my, my, my allegory sensor starts to go off and I, you know, begin to see this as really drawing our attention to the kind of landscape that she's operating in, right? Then the Cheshire Cat appears uh, and disappears, or rather the head of the Cheshire Cat appears. And this upsets the Queen. Um, the Cheshire Cat has a conversation with Alice and the Queen gets mad and wants to cut off its head, right? Um, but then the King and the Queen and the Executioner are all having a debate about the Cheshire Cat and its head, uh, and Alice is called in. The moment Alice appeared, she was appealed to by all three to settle the question, and they repeated their arguments to her, though as they all spoke at once, she found it very hard to make out exactly what they said. The executioner's argument was that you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from, and that he had never had to do such a thing before, and he wasn't going to begin at this time of life. <clears throat> the, queen's ar the king's argument was that anything that had a head could be beheaded, and that you weren't to talk nonsense. The queen's argument was that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd had everybody she'd have everybody executed all round. It was this last remark that had made the whole party look so grave and anxious. Um, I love the way that the queen's argument comes in. You have the executioner's argument, right, which makes sense, right? He is puzzled. He doesn't know how to behead somebody who doesn't seem to have a body, right? You have the king's rather desperate argument um, that anything that had a head could be beheaded, obviously. Um, and then the queen's argument, which, of course, is no argument at all, that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd had to ev have everybody executed all round. Um, uh, <laughs> not going to begin at this time, at his time of life it is a really funny line. Um yeah, yeah. Um, he never had to do such a thing before and wasn't going to begin at his time of life. Um, yeah, yeah. Decapitating headless or bodiless people, like disembodied people that, yeah, like d cutting off disembodied heads. Yeah, he's way too, uh, he's not gonna, he's not going to start at this time of life. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Fourth Dauntless, I also thought that the king's argument was very noteworthy, given the central role of nonsense in this story. Um, the executioner does not indeed seem to me to be talking nonsense, um, certainly not by the standards of nonsense that have been established uh, to this point. <coughs> There's a, a, a kind of very simple and straightforward logic of the executioner's argument, right? Um, and it does seem to be, by the way, logic that uh, you know, both logic and rhetoric uh, that are being played with here, right? Um, you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from. Um, that is simple logic, Right, um, the you know contained within the, uh, the 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 substance of the command to cut off its head does suggest that there's a body. Right, you can't cut anything off if there's nothing to cut it off from. Perfectly, um, perfectly logical. Right, um, the second half, Carita, which I agree is much more comical. Uh, that he had never had to do such a thing before and he wasn't going to begin at his time of life um, undermines the logic of his earlier claim somewhat, right? Because um, if you begin by arguing that something is simply impossible or even indeed a contradiction in terms, right? That thing that you have commanded me to do cannot be done because it's a contradiction in terms, right? Um if that's your starting point of your argument, it does seem rather to undermine that argument to, to then say, um, anyway, I've never been asked to do this before and I'm not going to begin at my time of life, right? Um, to merely re resort to stubbornness, essentially, right? Like, uh, I'm used to the way I'm used to things and I, I don't want things to change and I'm not okay with that. Um does not really make any sense. So if there's any nonsense in the executioner's argument, it's the segue from simple logic to um, the sort of assertion of um, uh, of 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 stubbornness, right? Um, yeah, yeah, he might have a union, Carita, or at least he might be thinking of forming one, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, but for Thoughtless, coming back to your point, I completely agree um, that um, I completely agree that um, the injunction "you aren't to talk nonsense" is a command that has been <laughs> very broadly disobeyed to this point in the book. Right? Um, there seem to be precious few of the uh, residents of Wonderland uh, that seem to follow that particular injunction, right? Um, but in any case, his argument, anything that had a head could be beheaded. Well, that makes a certain amount of sense too, right? You've got two logical propositions. Um, notice, what does it hinge on? the difference between the two arguments. Both seem to hold water, logically speaking, right? You can't cut off a head unless there's a body to cut it off from, and anything that had a head could be beheaded, right? Both of those two things seem logically defensible claims, right? Wherein lies the difference? I think this is kind of interesting. The difference, it seems to me, is a linguistic one. They're not using the same word. They're using synonyms, but not the same word. Uh, the king's word is beheaded. The executioner's word, well, phrase, is cut off its head, right? Um, anything that has a head can be beheaded, but you can't cut off a head, right? The, the, the executioner's... Uh, the uh, the force of the executioner's argument rests upon the use of the preposition off, right? If you, to cut something off means to remove it from something else, right? And if there's nothing else there, you can't cut it off. Um, so he is, uh, both of them are sort of resting on a technicality, a technicality of their particular word choices, which are synonyms. 
but which should not surprise us at this point, are not, when we look at them carefully, exactly saying exactly the same thing, right? Um, and that that the that simple logic could be used to prove sort of to prove the case one direction or the other, um, depending on which synonym you used. Well, that seems to be very much of a piece with what we've seen about the careful attention that's being drawn to words and how words are uh, being chosen, being being used. Yeah, Mighty Felix, I agree that one is sort of positive and one is negative. Um, it does have a head and it doesn't have a body. Um, yes, so they're kind of, the, the way that they've framed it um, forces them to kind of approach it from a different perspective, right? Take its head from off its body. Uh, behead it, right? You know, uh, those are two different ways of thinking about the same thing. And yet, in a case like this, where you have a disembodied head uh, to deal with, um, it does, in fact, create that, uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of difference there, right? Now, the Queen's argument cuts across them both, right? The Queen doesn't care. If something wasn't done about it, in less than no time, she'd, had, she'd have everybody executed all round. Um, the, um, yeah, <laughs> several of you are asking, which seems a perfectly valid question to be asking in the context of Alice in Wonderland, why the word beheaded is beheaded and not deheaded or unheaded. Um, yeah, Jackrabbit Monster, I'm thinking about the same thing. Um, uh, The word, the prefix B, normally means to, um, like if you, um, uh, if you are beringed, for instance, it means you have lots of rings on, right? To bering someone means to put lots of rings on it, right? Um, yes, to bedite means to dite things, right? It means you've got clothes on, right? Um, uh, uh, to betroth means to plight your troth, right? If you are bedazzled, you have been dazzled, right? If you're bewitched, you have been witched, <laughs> right? It's the verb form of uh, being witched. Bedecked, same thing. Um, I agree that in this way, beheaded is rather an odd word, it would seem, right? Um uh, so when you're beheaded, you've been turned into a head. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess, I guess. Um, but perhaps this again, um, yeah. So, well, Aaron, that's exactly the problem is that where I'm trying to think of any other example where the B prefix has survived as an, ex as expressing removal. <clears throat> Can we think of a singular other example of that? Because I can't at the moment. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I can't think of any. Um, But it would seem it doesn't have the same sort of structure, right? Of um, if we're thinking about the body, like if we're thinking about like unheading the body or, or like decapitating, right? We have another word, which is almost the same word, right? Um, except Latin. And there we have the D prefix, right? Um, which is a, you know, negating, right? To deconstruct means to do the reverse of constructing, right? Uh, to, uh, um, uh, yeah, so the D, um, the D prefix in front of the Latin uh, word for head, right? Decapitate means, clearly means to take the head off, like to take the head off the body, right? To, 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 D-head the body. 
unhead the body. Um, but to be beheaded. Yeah, I mean, I'm coming back to, you know, was it JJ saying when you're beheaded, you're you're turned into a head? Um, uh, yeah. I don't get that word. Um, but this seems to be a fruitful digression. A fruitful digression because, of course... Anytime you, um, you know, when we're, when we're reading this book in particular, right, as aware of words and word choice as this book has made us, right, um, it seems conspicuous, especially in the context of this sentence, right? Anything that had a head could be beheaded and that you weren't to talk nonsense, Except, of course, the more we think about it, the more it sounds like that statement. Anything that had a head could be beheaded um, begins to sound like nonsense, doesn't it? Um, Okay. All right. So... JJ is looking th- looking this up on uh, um, Edom Online. So that the B prefix comes from the same from the Old English B prefix, which tends to mean by like the the same thing as bylaws, bygones, bystander, basically. Um, Yes. The Old English prefix was also used to make transitive verbs. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Like we were talking about, like to bering or bedeck or bedite something. Um, Yeah, I... But you know what I'm not seeing, JJ? Any other examples of it being used in a privative sense. The rest of them. Yes, you can use the B-E prefix um, uh, to... um, You can use it intensively, and that's a lot of fun. Yes, like the word bethwack, to thrash soundly. Um, Yes, Using it as uh, using it as an intensifier like that, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, hmm. Okay, so it's behead, behead. Wow. So you're suggesting there, Jackrabbit Monster, that uh, head in in the verbal sense, like the headsman, right? So like. What the headsman's done is is head people, right? Um, meaning to take off their heads. Uh, and that behead would then be an intensifier of that? I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I'm finding a resolution to this <laughs> in the uh, in the, the spontaneous research uh, that we're doing here. Um yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, but that, but again, the point that I would make is that I think Mighty Felix, I think it was you first who was asking this question about beheading. And that seems like a perfectly good question to be asking here. Um, exactly the sort of question uh, that, like, the kinds of words that get taken for granted. Um and but actually turn out to be um nonsense right um yeah so karita you couldn't use the word that way again like i you can't construct it in a primitive sense in any other way so like lopping off a foot and saying that you're befooting them no but if you just said i'm gonna befoot something it sounds like you're giving it a foot um again that's because it's not it's just not used 
in a privative sense in that way. Um, the, the privative privation, like to deprive something like of a head in this case. Um, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's really interesting. Um, that's really interesting. Anyway, um, but as I say, the Queen's argument cuts across all of this, right? She's just going to have everybody executed all round. Um, and everybody's looking very grave and anxious as a result of this. Um, notice the vagueness, right? Um, so the Queen has, the Queen has one angle, right? Um, she is just going to execute, order everybody's execution. That's all she does. Right. Um, she has exactly one move that she plays. And once again, that's hardly surprising as she's a card. Right. Um, and that seems to be one of the again, one of the jokes underlying the whole deck of cards play here is that in general, a card, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a simple it signifies one thing. Right. Um, and she, she has, she has one card that she keeps playing, right? The execution card, ordering everybody executed. This is not helpful. Um, this is, this is not helpful under these, uh, uh, under these situations, uh, under these circumstances. Um, but, uh, but again, like what can you, you can't expect much depth from a character who's literally two dimensional, <laughs> right? I mean, I suppose there's technically a measurable thickness to the card, but basically a two-dimensional character, right? Um, well, let's keep going. When we get into chapter nine, Alice is going and she meets the Duchess again, right? And the Duchess has just been in prison and she's just been released from prison. Um, there's a whole bunch from the conversation between the Duchess and Alice that I wanted to talk about, but I um, try to restrict myself uh, uh, the game's going on rather better now, she said, by way of keeping up the conversation a little. This is Alice to the Duchess. And remember, the Duchess is going around with her with her head on her shoulder, right? Uh, the, her, the Duchess is resting her chin on Alice's shoulder, and Alice is, Alice is rather uncomfortable. The Duchess is invading her personal space, right? And Alice is rather uncomfortable, especially because the Duchess is very ugly indeed, we're told. The game's going on rather better now, she said, by way of keeping up the conversation a little. "'Tis so," said the Duchess, "'and the moral of that is, "'Oh, tis love, tis love, that makes the world go round.' "'Somebody said,' Alice whispered, "'that it's done by everybody minding their own business.' Oops. "'Ah, well, it means much the same thing,' said the Duchess, "'digging her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder as she added, "'And the moral of that is, "'take care of the sense, and the sounds will take care of themselves.' "'How fond she is of finding morals in things,' Alice thought to herself. "'Um,' Okay, um, now, you remember the reference, right? Uh, the minding their own business reference. Uh, because, of course, this is the same Duchess from, what was it, chapter six? Uh, the uh, Pig and Pepper uh, chapter. Um, and uh, uh, she, um, it was the Duchess who said that the world would go around a good deal better a good deal faster if everybody minded their own business. Um, she said that as a crushing remark to Alice, right, to stop Alice inquiring um, when Alice was concerned about the welfare of the baby, right, whom the Duchess was singing horrible lullabies to uh, and, uh, uh, and perpetrating violence towards. Um, <coughs> so... Alice whispers this to herself. Somebody said that it's done by everybody minding their own business, right? So she's, on the one hand, rebutting her, rebutting the Duchess by quoting the Duchess's earlier speech, right? Alice felt crushed um, by the Duchess's remark. Remember, Alice tried to turn it around and, and um, show off her learning, right, by saying that it wouldn't actually do at all. We wouldn't want the world to go around faster. That would not be an advantage, right? Um, and the Duchess then just told her to shut up again a little bit more directly. Um, the Duchess, Alice is responding to the moral that the Duchess has just given 
Um, so Alice begins in this passage by making a piece of rather empty conversation, right? She makes a, a rather trivial observation about what's going on around them, right? Um, the game's going on rather better now. Um, and she's, we're told, she said this by way of keeping up the conversation a little, right? She felt awkward walking around with the Duchess, with the Duchess resting her chin on her shoulder um, without saying anything, right? So she makes an innocuous comment about the things around them. And it's it's rather an empty comment, right? Um, and of course, she's gotten in trouble about this sort of thing before. But you remember the sort of trouble that she got into before, right? Um, and that is people sticking to her sense, right? Pointing out, like taking her words um, at a sort of face value, right? Um, not kind of playing along with the social game that she is invoking, right? But instead taking her words quite literally and all that sort of thing. That's not what the Duchess does, right? The Duchess takes um, her rather broad observation and um, draws a moral from it. <clears throat> and the moral of that is, right, and this is now the Duchess's favorite thing to do, to draw morals of everything, as Alice points out at the end, how fond she is of finding morals in things. Um, and of course, yes, this is, um, it's not just children's stories, it's all kinds of things, Gerald, that come with morals here, right? Um, story is to be improving, right? Uh, morally improving for children. So she draws a moral from Alice's comment, right? The moral of the game going on rather better now, I guess, is tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. Now, <clears throat> there's no very obvious link between the thing that Alice just made a benign obser observation about and the moral that the Duchess draws, right? Um... Uh, tis love, tis love that makes the world go round uh, well. That's an improving moral, I guess. Um, but um, Alice's response, she doesn't critique it, right? She doesn't question the link between the two. Um, what she does is snipe at the Duchess concerning what the Duchess sniped at her. Somebody said that it's done by everybody minding their own business. Um, Alice is just whispering it as if she doesn't want the Duchess to hear, but the Duchess's ear is like an inch from her mouth, right? As the Duchess's face is resting on her shoulder, right? So, of course, the Duchess hears what she whispers, right? Um, and uh, it's a little bit funny to be snippy about the moral tis love tis love that makes the world go round um, and the contrast with the Duchess's previous words about everybody minding their own business uh, right which is would seem to be if not quite exactly the opposite of tis love that makes the world go round it's uh, something close right um, instead of you know it's uh, uh, you know love and the the, the sort of the union between creatures, right, that makes the world go around and everybody ought to mind their own business, right, and not be connected with each other and not um, uh, you know, be involved in other people's lives. That it's something as is something close to the opposite of love. Um, so Alice, is, Alice isn't wrong uh, to point out the shift in philosophy that the Duchess seems to have adopted here. Um, but think about also the posture here. Um, the, to be slightly creepy, resting of her chin on Alice's shoulder. Again, Alice feels sort of invaded here. Um, she dislikes the Duchess. She did not like her before. She does not like her now. Um, she's repulsive. She's physically repulsive, right? Um, that's what Alice dislikes about her. Um, and her kind of perching on Alice's shoulder. Um, I mean, it's not quite like a, a, a sort of um, uh, 
you know, this, this sort of devil angel thing, right? Um, but it begins to almost sound like that, right? Um, and what I couldn't help but think of with the fact that what the Duchess is this, uh, when she's in this posture, uh, she's this uh, like a never ending um, cycle of, of, of morals, right? Of intrusive morals. She's constantly intruding these morals. Alice is trying to have a conversation, whether with her or with somebody else, right? And the Duchess continues to interrupt her with these intrusive morals, these morals which are both intrusive, literally intrusive into the conversation, changing the topic and commenting on what happened, but again, preventing really conversation from moving forward as well. Um, and also intrusive in the sense of, well, minding Alice's business, right? Um, getting up in Alice's business, as it were, um, by giving her these improving morals all the time to everything that happens. And so the idea of this ugly face perched right there on her shoulder where she can't avoid it um, did make me think of the way in which uh, these kinds of morals, uh, the, the pervasiveness of this kind of moral, right? Like you can't ever be allowed to enjoy a story without, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, ugly face spitting out a moral at you, right? All the time. Um, there just seems to be something kind of um, a, a sense in which the posture of Alice and the Duchess is kind of dramatizing that, right? Um, and the first, the thing she accuses the Duchess of here, frankly, is hypocrisy, right? Um, and this is a pretty good comeback by Alice. Somebody said it's done by everybody minding their own business, right? With the subtext, I wish you would mind your own business and get out of my business, right? Um uh, but um, anyway, yes, yeah, so I think that that's uh, um, that's that's kind of fun. Oh, well, it means much the same thing, said the Duchess. Digging her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder as she added, and the moral of that is. So notice there's, there's pain involved as well. It's almost like a punishing experience, right? Um, she punitively digs her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder, right? Um the morals are uncomfortable. Uh, the giving of the morals seems to be done almost, uh, almost spitefully, right? Um, yeah. Now, um, but of course, what has she just said? Oh, well, it means much the same thing. What? That tis love, tis love that makes the world go round and um, the world, uh, everybody minding their own business makes the world go round? Um, no, that's not much the same thing at all. As I said, it's almost the opposite of each other. Um, and notice the moral, she now gives a moral on her own reflection, right? So first she makes a nonsensical and dismissive comment to Alice, right? It means much the same thing, right? Brushing her off and then draws a moral on the brushing off comment that she just made, right? And the moral of that is take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. That, of course, is precisely the opposite of the lesson. If, uh, you know, the other two are almost opposites, this is quite exactly um, opposite of the lesson that it seemed that Alice was being taught at the Mad Tea Party, right? In fact, the March Hare and the Mad Hatter would have a field day with that comment take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. Um, remember what Alice, the trouble that Alice got into when she said that meaning what you say and saying what you mean are basically the same thing. Right. Um, and they launched off into their exposition of how those two things are not the same thing at all. Right. And to compare what saying that is like, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. Um, yes, this is, a. this is a, there's a joke here, right? Um, uh, and yes, there is, um, there is a song, Mighty Felix, you're right, that tis love, tis love that makes the world go round. Yes, that, that is a song. Um, uh, yes. And the, at the end, there's the, 
the moral that she's drawing is a pun on an economic proverb, Jackrabbit. Yes, take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves. Um, yes, exactly, exactly. But it's, it's twisted, right? Take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. And all of a sudden now we're talking about meaning what you say and saying what you mean again, right? With the Duchess saying to Alice... Um, if you focus on what you mean, the sounds, that is the actual words that you make, will naturally take care of themselves, right? It is not true. Think about the way that pe- the, the, the original proverb about pence and pounds, um, uh, you, that's about thriftiness, Right? Um, if you take care of the pence, the pounds will take care of themselves. That is, if you if you if you mind small things in money, right, it will add up over time. Um, and so, if you save pennies here and pennies there, you will eventually be saving pounds, right? The pounds will take care of themselves if you take care of the pence. Um, you can so see you can see this the the sense of that proverb about thriftiness, right? Um, but of course, the relationship, the the shifting of the you know the, of the p's into s's, right? Take care of the sense, and the sounds will take care of themselves. Um, draws attention to the link, right? Pence and pounds are connected linearly, right? Um, you know, there's. I think a hundred pence in a pound. Um, I'm always, I'm always, uh, once we start into guineas and shillings, I get, I always get a little fuzzy, but, uh, um, but I'm pretty sure with pence and pounds, um, it's a little bit straightforward. Um, but of course there is absolutely no such relationship between sense and sound, right? Between what you mean and what you say. You can't just have good intentions, you know, that will accumulate into wise words, right? Um, All you have to focus on is what you mean to say. Don't worry about what you actually say. The sounds will take care of themselves, right? If you just focus on the meaning. Um, uh, So, um, anyway, um, I think that it's... um, uh, it's a fascinating spin, though, and so and notice what uh, another thing that w- Lewis Carroll is once again having something not quite come out right, right? Um, he's sort of twisting a standard moral, a standard you know epigram, and making it come out strangely, right? But this, of course, is one that is uh, very, very relevant to what has been happening and is very much in defiance of what the Duchess herself is doing, right? Her sounds are not making a whole lot of sense, actually, right? Um, The meaning is not the same between the two things that have just been said, right? Um, And Alice notes how fond she is of finding morals in things, right? Um, And think about what that means as well. What does it mean to find a moral in things, right? That there's a, um, to take something and apply it in a, to find a moral in something is to relate to that thing um, in a different sort of way. Um, The Mad Tea Party draws attention to sense and sound, right? It draws attention to like the difference between meaning what you say and saying what you mean, right? The, The Duchess the Duchess's dynamic of finding morals here is less about the intending and the saying about well, is less about the sound and the sense and more about the reception, right? Um, what do you hear when you hear something, right? What are you listening to? What are you paying attention to? What are you getting from a thing, right? Um, and if you're listening to a story and you are finding just seeking to find a moral in it, right? Um, You are not necessarily receiving the sense of what it's attempting to deliver, right? Maybe you are, 
it, there may be an easy moral that is, you know, you, you, you may be just drawing out a moral that is, you know, very much thematic uh, to the particular story or saying or whatever. Um, but that is not always the case. And the level of disjunction between the Duchess's morals and the thing that was just said before suggests that her fondness for finding morals, uh, in fact, almost prevents her entirely from listening, right? Even from hearing the things that other people are saying. Um, uh, again, there's no link in the end at all between sense and sound. The sense of what the other person means, the sounds that they say, um, you are instead finding a new sense, right, which you are ultimately sort of imposing upon it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Let's get at least our introduction here to the Mock Turtle. The other guests had taken advantage of the Queen's absence and were resting in the shade. However, the moment they saw her, they hurried back to the game, the queen merely remarking that a moment's delay would cost them their lives. All the time they were playing, the queen never left off quarreling with the other players and shouting, off with his head or off with her head. Those whom she sentenced were taken into custody by the soldiers, who of course had to leave off being archers to do this, so that by the end of half an hour or so, there were no archers left, and all the players except the king, the queen, and Alice were in custody and under sentence of execution. Then the queen left off quite out of breath and said to Alice, Have you seen the mock turtle yet? No, said Alice. I don't even know what a mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from, said the queen. I never saw one or heard of one, said Alice. Come on then, said the queen, and he shall tell you his history. As they walked off together, Alice heard the king say in a low voice to the company generally, You are all pardoned. Come, that's a good thing, she said to herself, for she had felt quite unhappy at the number of executions the queen had ordered. Okay. Um, yes, I love Jack Rabbit Monster, the, uh, the merely there, right? The queen merely remarking that a moment's delay would cost them their lives, right? Um, yes, yes, a mere remark. Again, the queen has one play, right? She is a, a signifier that points to one sign, right? Off with his head, off with her head. Um, there's almost no other way she has of interacting with people, right? Um, but we don't have any evidence of actual executions. Um, the king is pardoning everybody that she is sentencing to death. Um, and we have, of course, the what sh the context in which she's sentencing people to death um, is in the context of the game of croquet, right, that everybody is meant to be playing. Um, and she's constantly condemning all of the other players to death, which necessitates the soldiers who are the arches um, and therefore the entire parameters of the game um, to take them into custody. And thus she utterly eliminates the entire game um, by incarcerating uh, all of the other players under sentence of death and removing all of the arches so nobody can play at all anymore. Um, uh, <laughs> everyone, I, I, I just, I love that last phrase. And all of the players, except the king, the queen, and Alice, were in custody and under sentence of execution. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and Karina, I think I agree with you um, that um, the uh, the the king is on the one hand undermining the queen, but on the other hand, he's also assisting the queen. I think you're quite right about that, Karina, uh, because if all of the people that the queen ordered executed were actually executed, um, there would very soon be no one left, right? By, by pardoning everybody... Um, he is, in fact, facilitating yet another round of executions to be ordered by her. And that's what she actually does, right? The, the, the card that she plays, right, the, uh, the one action that the queen takes here um, is not executing people, but ordering their execution. And what's the fun of ordering people's executions if you soon, you know, if you could only do it for a brief time before you've had everybody, um, everybody executed. Um, uh, so yes, there, there does seem to be, um, um, yeah. Oh man, JJ, I am, uh, I feel very confident, um, that, um, 
uh, the Phantom Toll Booth draws rather heavily on uh, Lewis Carroll. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Jack and Red Monster were saying the same thing. Um, <coughs> and yes, I don't know, Gerald, um, how you put a card's head on a pike exactly. Um, I'm not even sure, like how. I'm not quite sure what exactly these cards look like. That is, they seem to have hands and feet. Um, but I don't know if they otherwise have heads, even. This is one of the things that's puzzled me about the Queen's um, constant uh, sentencing of people to decapitation, uh, because I don't know that they have heads. Do they have heads that are separate from the cards? I'm not sure that they do. But anyway, um, we're going to go off to see the Mock Turtle. Um, now, there is, well, one is tempted to say a delicious reversal here, right? Turtle soup was very popular. Um, but um, also popular was Mock Turtle Soup, which, of course, is turtle soup uh, that you can make uh, while harming no actual turtles um, in the process, right? No turtles are harmed in the making of mock turtle soup. Um, so it's like a, you know, it's like the humane version of it. Now, I don't know enough. Somebody can look this up. Um, what did they flavor mock turtle soup with to make it kind of taste like turtle soup, even though there's no turtles in it, right? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but um, notice how uh, Lewis ha uh, notice, notice how Lewis Carroll has reversed this, right? Um, we're going to go meet the mock turtle. And Alice doesn't know what a mock turtle is. Well, a mock turtle is defined as the thing mock turtle soup is made from. Right. Uh, so if you don't have turtles available, you can still you make mock turtle soup out of a mock turtle. Right. Um, and. Uh, um, yeah. Calf's head is what you make mock turtle soup out of. OK. Per Wikipedia. Beef. OK. Sure. Sure. All right. Well, that explains the drawing then. Um, the drawing, uh, the illustration, uh, the canonical illustration uh, of the mock turtle is something with the body of a turtle but the feet and head of a cow. Uh, so that would explain why he depicted it that way. Um, okay, there you go. Um, so yes, made from beef, which is often more readily available than turtle, especially in sufficient quantities, presumably. Um, but... Um, But yeah, again, to have the mock turtle identified as the thing that mock turtle soup is made from um, brings me back to the mouse. Um, Alice's non, his, her unfriend, the mouse, right at the beginning, the one with the long, sad tail, um, as that would seem to be a thing that you wouldn't want to bring up around the mock turtle, right? Um, rather than being the first thing that you mention uh, as, a, as a result of it. Um, but um, so that, that there seems to be a, a, a familiar kind of insensitivity, right, uh, which suggests that this conversation might not uh, go well for the mock turtle. Um, but um, the mock turtle and Alice uh, and the griffin, remember, there's a griffin who uh, brings Alice over there. So the griffin is heavily involved in the entire mock turtle conversation. Um, and they start talking about lessons. Now, you'll remember that Alice has a love-hate relationship with her lessons, right? On the one hand, um, she several times expresses a good deal of pleasure that she's not able to do her lessons or that perhaps she'd never be able to um, do lessons again, like, for instance, when she was so large that there was no room for books um, uh, in the room so she wouldn't be able to have any lessons anymore. Uh, and she found that quite a pleasant prospect. Um, so she doesn't like the actual process of her lessons. But at the same time, 
she is very proud of all the things that she knows and has learned, right? And spends a good deal of time uh, bragging or attempting to brag about uh, the stuff that she has learned, obviously, in her lessons. Um, and of course, it has been a source of difficulty to her that reciting her lessons, that is, whether it's repeating her multiplication tables or whether it's um, uh, uh, reciting poetry that she's learned by heart, that has not gone well so far, right? She's not been able to replicate her lessons here. Um, and uh, anyway, so she... Um, when she, so she gets into this conversation with the mock turtle who is bragging about the curriculum of the school that it went to under the ocean, right? We had the best of educations. In fact, we went to school every day. This is the mock turtle speaking. I've been to a day school too, said Alice. You needn't be so proud as all that, right? It's, I mean, why brag about going to school every day? Of course you go to school every day. I went to school every day too, right? Um, so notice immediately Alice is turned about um, instead of dreading her lessons or saying bad things about her lessons. Um, she's defending her lessons because her own educational status is at stake here, right? Um, uh, she doesn't want to be ignorant. She wouldn't want to be mistaken for Mabel or something, presumably. With extras, asked the mock turtle a little anxiously. Yes, said Alice. We learned French and music. Okay, so those are extra lessons, right? Not the core lessons. So you've got the core curriculum, right? And then you've got the extras, which for Alice apparently are French and music. And washing, said the mock turtle. Certainly not, said Alice indignantly. Why do you think Alice is indignant about that? What does that betray? Her indignation, what does her indignation betray there when she says, certainly not, that she didn't learn washing, right? Um... And it seems to me that there might be two things underlying that there. One, of course, is that it seems to call into question her own um, cleanliness, perhaps, or if it's washing herself that she's talking about, um, uh, that, uh, you know, she did not need to be taught washing, right? She already knew how to wash perfectly well. But I do suspect, Jocelyn, that there's a class distinction here, too, um, that if you're being taught to wash things, right? Um, well, servants do that, right? Um, and Alice is not a servant. Um, she's certainly not going to that sort of school where you would be learning menial uh, uh, service tasks. Exactly. Um, exactly. She's not going to washerwoman's school um, and would be indignant um, at uh, it being implied that, you know, she might do. Um but the mock turtle has cheerfully thrown in washing, right, along with French and music as the extras that apparently he studied at his school. Ah, then yours wasn't a really good school, said the mock turtle in a tone of great relief. Now at ours, they had at the end of the bill, French, music, and washing extra. You couldn't have wanted it much, said Alice, living at the bottom of the sea. Right, how do you, how do you wash things underwater, Alice wants to know. I couldn't afford to learn it, said the mock turtle with a sigh. I only took the regular course. So having bragged about the extras at his school, right, he then has to confess that um, he didn't take any of the extras, right, because you have to pay extra for the extras, and he couldn't afford them. Um, so, um, yeah, at Fort Thala says, is, the, is this end of the bill a reference to a bill in a restaurant? Um it sounds like that, or rather like a bill, a bill can be generally used as like a notice, right? Um, so like when you post a bill uh, to advertise your school, right? At the end of the bill, uh, it would say, so it gives, you know, you could take the regular course, right? And at the bottom of the bill, uh, at the end of the bill, right? You would say music, uh, French music and washing extra, basically. Um, so yeah, exactly. Uh, an advertisement, Mighty Felix, is just what I'm thinking about it, too. Um, but um, uh, the Mock Turtle has no comment on the fact that they didn't want any washing at all. Apparently, he did want it, but he wasn't able to have it, right? So she asks about the regular course. What was that? inquired Alice. Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, the Mock Turtle replied, and then the different branches of arithmetic. Ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. 
I never heard of uglification, Alice, Alice ventured to say. What is it? Um, by the way, I am 100% convinced uh, that the reference to uglification uh, in the uh, uh, island of the Duffelpuds in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is a reference to this passage about uglification. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm 100% confident. Alice is, I've never heard of uglification. Um, Lucy asks almost the same thing. What do you mean by uglification? Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm almost completely sure of that. <coughs> now, what do we make of this? The curriculum, of course, goes on this way. Um, I, uh, I, re- I really like how they, they study laughing in Greek. As, uh, sorry, laughing in grief as well. Right, instead of Latin and Greek, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, reeling and writhing, yeah. <laughs> Edith says, "I, I was, I don't know how old when I figured out that these were puns." Yes, um, this is something that I think comes across much better uh, to the ear than to the eye. Um, reeling and writhing. Uh, you you start with reeling and writhing, obviously, um, and then arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, these apparently are JJ mock classes in some sense. Um, reeling and writhing is a really interesting beginning, isn't it? Um, Well, the school is at the bottom of the sea, right? And so reeling uh, would seem to be uh, rather alarming, uh, uh, a rather alarming first subject to learn, wouldn't it? Um, That is, if we're thinking of a fishing reel. Um, And of course, if someone were found themselves on the end of a reel, uh, in that, uh, of a fishing reel, right? Uh, they would be doing a great deal of writhing, uh, attempting to escape. Um, so, uh, reeling and writhing in a, an aquatic sense, Sarah J does sound a little bit morbid to me too. Um, and that you begin with that seems, uh, rather shocking, uh, indeed. Um, but even if we don't think of fishing reels, uh, exactly, um, at the at the very it's it's at the very least puzzling, right? Um, it, you it could think of it, Jocelyn, as watery movements, um, uh, sort of squiggling around, right? Uh, and uh, um, you know, reeling also could sound like a dance. We did so. The, those of us who were at Mythmoot did some reeling um, while we were there. Some of us uh, were reeling more hectically than others. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, you could you could reel in a you could reel and or writhe in a slightly more benign way, um, but um, but it does uh, uh, still seem rather alarming uh, in context, um, and all of the math is made is twisted, right? Um, twisted into negative things. Ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. Um, None of those things are extremely attractive, right? Uh, Ambition seems like perhaps the least negative of the four, um, but but it's still not a great thing, right? Um, yes, the vowels and stresses are all there, Mighty Felix. Exactly like I said, I, these puns work better to the ear than to the eye. And when you hear it, you can hear it, right? Ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. Um, they're the same words, but shifted, right? Um, some different sounds. Uh, so perhaps... Wait, remember that about minding the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves? These sounds are not taking care of themselves at all, right? Uh, this list can serve almost by itself as a kind of rebuttal uh, of the uh, uh, of the Duchess's moral right there. Um, so I think for Thoughtless Ambition, it's not as obviously negative as the other three, um, 
but um, I, but I think it is. I, my suspicion is that um, to a Victorian child and to a Victorian girl child, I think especially, um, ambition would be negative still on on uh, um, on the whole. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I hear you about um, ambition being a secondary virtue in classical philosophy, but again, I don't... I, I, not in this context, I think. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. No, ambition... Um, well, it's not safe, certainly. And distraction is not bad, right? Um, and I suppose uglification isn't exactly wicked. Um, derision is really probably the worst of the four, in one sense. Um, uh, but, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. Um, yeah, Jackrabbit Monster, I can't... Um, um, I can't lose the fact either that um, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician, right? Um, so his jokes at the expense of math uh, strike a bit close to home, right? I mean, this is a person who taught math, right? Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but again... What this seems to me is it seems to me an object lesson um, in how the sounds won't take care of themselves uh, if you mind the sense, right? Um, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision are not indeed the different branches of arithmetic. Um, and I'm hoping that reeling and writhing is not, in fact, part of the regular course under the sea. Um, this sounds exactly like when Alice's words are not coming out quite right. Um, and I'm, I cannot help but wonder all the way through, um, uh, you know, with laughing and grief, for instance, uh, if there, if we don't have a similar sort of situation here. Um, that the joke lies in the fact that we we know what he's actually talking about, right? We know what the regular course is. You start with reading and writing, obviously, and then you go on to the four branches of arithmetic, uh, and then you go on later to learn Latin and Greek. Um, all those things, you know, would make perfect sense, except, well, when the sounds aren't taking care of themselves, you end up saying something quite different, right? Um, uh instead of multiplication, you're doing uglification, right? Uh, and that is not nearly so improving, right? Um, but now Alice becomes intrigued. And how many hours a day did you do lessons, said Alice, in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day, said the Mock Turtle, nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan, exclaimed Alice. That's the reason they're called lessons, the griffin remarked, because they lessen from day to day. This was quite a new idea to Alice, and she thought it over a little before she made her next remark. Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday? Of course it was, said the mock turtle. And how did you manage on the twelfth? Alice went on eagerly. Um, no, she's not answered, right? That question of hers is not answered. Um, Alice... likes this idea, right, of uh, lessons, lessening, right? And once again, we can see, as I said, her sort of uh, uh, love and hate uh, relationship uh, between, uh, with, with lessons, right? Um, the griffin, the pun of the griffin, um, well, I mean, the pun which the griffin explains, right, which seems to be, uh, which the mock turtle is, uh, taking for granted, right? Uh, between lesson and lesson. Uh, 
sort of builds this tension here where half the time when we're listening to the description of the mock turtle of the academic plan at his excellent school beneath the ocean, um, we're, it's like we're supposed to not pay any attention to the sounds, right? Um, with this kind of a pun, lesson and lesson, we're supposed to hear these sounds and appreciate how they point in different directions, right? Um, to to take those that combination of sounds and bring together a combination of meanings. This is how puns work, right? Uh, the kind of the tension between uh, the the tension inherent in the ambiguity of the direction in which the word is pointing, right? We talked about you know the Queen of Hearts pointing to one thing, right? Um, her being you know the, the sort of unidirectional sign that the Queen of Hearts is. Um, puns. Uh, the fun of puns is that they are drawing attention to the fact that the sign. Right, those particular sound combinations point in more than one direction. Now, again, this works better for the ear than it does for the eye because you can see the difference between lesson, your lesson plan, and your plan to lessen them. Right? They're not spelled the same. On on right there in print, you can see the difference between the two words, um, but you can't hear the difference between the two words really, um, <coughs> and that's how puns work, right? Um, and we've had similar kinds of puns, not exactly, right? There's been a, ch you know, reeling and writhing. It's not the same as reading and writing, right? Um, but you just change one small thing and now all of a sudden you've quite significantly changed the entire word concept, right? So we're doing a different thing. Um, but again, it's, it's it, 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 as I say, it sort of shifts the grounds, the relationship between us and words, right? Um, uh, from where we were before to where we are now. Um, and yes, the pun uh, often uh, does things, you know, bridges things like that. Jack Rabbit is pointing out how one of those two words, lesson and lesson, um, one is Latinate and one is Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, yeah, it's often, um, puns are often just sort of purely linguistic coincidences like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, um, Fourth Thoughtless says reeling and writhing are very easy to mistake for the intended words, especially for adult readers who usually rely on shape rather than sp than on specific spelling. Uh, sometimes, yeah, exactly. There's um, um, there is a it's a subtle change, right? It's one sound, right? You replace the D with an L, and then you replace the T with a TH, and you go from reading and writing to reeling and writhing. Um, and uh, so, you, again, you see, like, the, the sounds won't take care of themselves, right? You do have to mind the sounds or you totally change the sense. Um, and here you've got the sounds being the same and it having now a completely different sense, which ceases to make sense. Um, it's fine to have a holiday on day 11, right? But how do you manage on the 12th day? Um, once you've lessened, uh, how do you go to school for more than 10 days uh, by this plan, right? Um, Aaron, I do believe that the story is mainly written for adults to read aloud to children. Um, I do think, I do believe that that is the, um, the way in which we are introduced to the sort of communal adult telling stories interactively write to young children, the three girls in the boat, uh, in the pro in the prefatory poem, um, establishes that as the kind of model for this story, right? A, a, an adult actually recounting this story uh, to children. Um, so yes, I do believe that's why we get both visual and oral components here, right? Because the children are likely to be consuming this um, by ear um, but someone is also looking at the page as well. So we get, you know, lots of visual things like the, um, the, uh, the long, sad tale, right. Of the mouse, the shape poem, uh, from the mouse, which of course can be shown to the child, right. The book can be turned around and shown to the child at that point as well. Um, yes, Jack Rabbit Monster. I do think that Lewis Carroll, the mathematician is, uh, uh, playing with the fact that we would have negative numbers, of lessons uh, on the 12th day, right? That we'd have negative one hour. And what exactly 
does that look like, right? What is a, what is a negative lesson? Um, once you've lessened beyond zero, and then of course there's the irony of um, if you continue to lessen past zero, you begin to get bigger, right? The more you lessen, the bigger the number gets now. Um, more negative, right, but larger. Um, and so this the kind of tension between the concept of lessening, right, and yet the mathematical system of integers, right, there's, a, there's an irony there that the, the lesser you get, the more you get um, uh, at the bottom. And maybe you do teach the teacher. Maybe that's what a negative lesson is like, right, when you uh, teach the teacher something. Um, and indeed, is that something like uh, Mighty Felix, something like what we see in Alice's attempts to recite things, right? Um, think about the ways in which her recitations of her lessons, which have not come out quite right, have nevertheless often commented upon them, right? Think about the um, the wonderful um, uh, 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 well, Father William poem, Um and the, the kind of commentary that it establishes on that uh, very trite and tedious poem. Um, there is something. There is like, that is almost like a lesson that's kind of returned back to the teacher with topspin, isn't it? Uh, so there is a sense in which Alice's recitations um, are like negative lessons in a sense, right? Uh, she's living out day 12, right, of the lessons. After this, I think we're, yes, we get to the lobster quadr quadrille and some poetry. Um, so we'll stop there. We'll stop with the lobster quid before we get to the lobster quadrille because it's getting late. Um, and um, I don't want to uh, spoil the wonder with haste. Uh, we have a good deal of poem, uh, poetry, including um, some more parody poetry uh, like the uh, Father William poem. Um, so... I look for, we will resume uh, chapter 9 and 10. Well, I think we're moving on to 10. Yes, we are. Well, so we'll resume at 10. So uh, go ahead and read 11 and 12. I don't really have any ambitions that we're going to get all the way through 12 uh, next time. Um, but go ahead and read uh, 11 and 12, and we'll do 10, and then we'll, we'll move on um, as, uh, as, as, we, as we move forward. But yes, um, we will have more... Um, uh, more poetry. There'll be more poetry, more soup uh, as we move forward. And yes, it's going to be two weeks from now. So I'm not going to be here next week. Next week, I'm uh, uh, next Tuesday is my 25th anniversary. Uh, so my wife and I are going away for the week for a little second honeymoon. Um, so I won't be available next week, I'm pleased to say. Um, but um, uh, I will be back the week after that. So uh, two weeks from today, we shall return and do uh, chapter 10 and the many poems therein. Uh, so thanks, everybody, and I will see you guys in a couple weeks. Bye now.